sweat and the, uh, the work of our hands we have together walked this journey. And may I say today that through the crucible of pain and through the crucible of difficulty, God has developed you in a new way. And this is the place that God has already destined for you, Michael. That place where you have longed for, that place that you have sought, that place that you have waited patiently for, and sometimes not so patiently. That place that God has set aside for you. And I know for Michael and Nola, Jeremiah 29 has been very special to them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, plans for good, plans for peace, and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And it might have seemed like an exile sometimes, it might have seemed that God has not been listening sometimes, but He has been attentive and He has had His plans in place since before the foundation of the earth that you would be here in this place. And I want to encourage you in that, both of you in, in that, that God's plan is sure and you are here because of that. Today I'd like to share with you about charging ahead. <laughs> As the church, sometimes we can stop right where we are, but God calls us to charge ahead. And so that under that heading today, I'd like to do two things. Give the charge for the pastor and give the charge for the church. For there is a charge that God places on our lives for His glory. For Moses said to Joshua, I just need to use my clicker. Um, and it works. Isn't that great? So we're up to the charge of the past first. And Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go forth with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or dismay. Michael, the charge to you today as you're inducted and as you begin in your role as pastor here at Kabulcha, that these words are for you. These are the words of Jesus to you today. Do not fear or be dismayed. Jesus who is risen, Jesus who is exalted, Jesus who is the ruler of the church and the one who gives pastors to the church, this is the one who brings these words to you today. This one would say to you, I the Lord go before you, I will be with you, I will not leave you or forsake you, do not fear or be dismayed. And in this text we see a couple of things. We see that there is a responsibility, but in the responsibility there are resources. A pastor is given great responsibility, but he is also given sufficient resources to fulfill the great responsibility. The charge to Michael is to bear the responsibilities of a gospel minister, of a one who is called to bring the gospel, not just you, but to lead this church in bringing the gospel, to be a minister of the word, to be a minister of Christ and to be a minister of the new covenant, also to be joyfully dependent on all the resources you have in Jesus Christ, filled with courage, filled with confidence that the Lord who goes before you he is the one who prepares you, and He has been preparing you, but has also been preparing this place. And in going, you feel the full riches of His grace. 
and you experience a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit who makes you sufficient for every task set before you. Seems like a mountain, doesn't it? <laughs> well, in some ways it can be. But God is the one who flattens mountains. God is the one who brings mountains down and brings valleys up. God is the one who makes the paths smooth. God is the one who walks before you. So I want to just share a few responsibilities and we'll just ramp them up to Michael. Uh, these responsibilities, are you getting ready? <laughs> the first one is example. A pastor is to be an example to the church, a man worthy of imitation, a godly example to the church. For the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now you and I know that we wouldn't put ourselves at the same level as the Apostle Paul. But he gives that same example to each of us as we lead others. He deliberately sets himself forward as an example. He spoke also to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11a. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. We try to leave the last two out. But there are those, the facts that Paul went ahead and said to Timothy, you see these things, and I have led you as an example in these things. Michael, follow hard after Christ. Follow hard after Jesus. Let your words be filled with truth and love. Let your conduct be merciful and just. Paul speaks in many other places about the examples that he gives to believers. But I love this quote from Robert Murray McChain. Now, he is a Scotsman that was a, a lot lived a long time ago, but it's quite pertinent. The greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. As a leader, you are called to that. The second thing, and I'm not going to go labour on too, too much today, uh, as some of you know I can be a little verbose. So I'm just going to cover off a few little things today. So the first thing is example, the second thing is prayer. Devote yourself to earnest prayer and intercession for the church. I put my whole paragraph, I don't know why I did that. We read of the pastor of Caphras in the Colossians 4 where he said of him, A servant of Christ always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Epaphras was a good pastor. Charles Spurgeon said this man was a good pastor. Praying for the church in this way. I don't want to say you and I know and this is almost just like this one conversation. I'll get to the rest here in a minute. But <laughs> you and I know, Michael, that this is a spiritual battle. There are spiritual strongholds. There is an enemy that tries to pull the church down. There is an enemy that tries to pull Christians apart. It is a spiritual battle. And we know that because Ephesians 6 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it goes on and says, Therefore, put on the full armour of God. There's your resource. Put on the full armour of God through prayer. Put on the full armour of God through right living, through holiness, through being an example. Put on the full armour of God every day. Third thing is this, evangelism and mission and preaching. Notice all the E's and the P's. You try to do as much as you can. I think sometimes in our Western church we've forgotten to be, be missional. We can easily settle back into our little holy huddle or our, our uh, gathering on a Sunday and be satisfied with that, that God is calling us to be His light and salt in the earth. 
the pastor is to do the work of evangelism. Not just him, but the whole church. To be missional in the community and to be devoted to making disciples. 1 Corinthians 9.22 To the weak I became weak, Paul says, that I might win the weak. And I love that song that you sang, that, Renee, that song, uh, beautiful. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might say so. This is not speaking about building up of believers, but reaching the lost. To bring people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Here is the an urgency in saving people. Oh, that we might get that urgency back into our lives, into the church. Oh, that we might see the urgency of seeing people come to Christ again. The, God, the pastor must be a gospel man, uncompromising in bringing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, preaching the word of God, to equipping people for their mission to Kabulcha and beyond. There is a mission for living hope, Church of Christ. There is a mission that you are in this community for a reason, and that's to bring the light of Christ into this community. God's people need God's word. They need the challenge. They need the correction. They need the commission to be God's light and salt in the world. That's why God calls you. Not just as the only one, but as a leader. Martin Luther said this, I simply taught, and this is not, a, I'm not trying to become an anti-Catholic, but I, this is just what he said. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then while I slept or drank, drank Wittenberg beer with, <laughs> with my Philip, or now Philip is a guy called Philip Melanchthon, and uh, I'm not saying that you should drink Wittenberg beer, <laughs> but this is just what he said. Or Armsdorf, which is, his name was Nicholas von Armsdorf. <laughs> I think some of those are taking up the call. <laughs> um, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. And that's the clincher of that quote. I did nothing. The word did it all. Preach the word. Next thing. This is the last bit. So we've had equipping, praying, evangelism, evangelism, uh, mission, preaching, and this is eldership and pastoring. The pastor is to be an equal elder of the church. I mean equal. He's not higher than any other elder. He's not lower than any other elder. And he ought not to be treated as so. He is an equal pastor of the church. Leadership is a weighty responsibility. You are a leader to guide the church. You are a leader to walk in front of the church. Leadership is critical for the health and the growth of the local congregation, a local church. If it is thwarted by those who aren't called into that position, it can destroy other leaders as well as the church. You are called to be the pastor here. First Timothy 3.1 The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. You are entering again, walking back into a noble task. An overseer is one who guides, or directs, or governs. Within the leadership of a church, the pastor has that significant role. Living with wisdom, in the truth of the gospel. Not being a people pleaser, but a God pleaser. And guiding the church in that manner. Be diligent in leadership. Give the people pastoral care. Not just as a normal person who just gives a, 
like a social worker who helps a person at the side, but do it with the compassion of Christ. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them, and he saw them as helpless and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. The whole part of his inner being was poured out for those people. Have the compassion of Christ. And I know that you do. Be a humble servant hearted leader. Shepherd the flock. Support them through life's trials. Lead them to maturity and point them to Christ. For you see, church, the church of Jesus Christ is not about us. It's all about Jesus. We're here to highlight Jesus. We're here to make Jesus famous. We're here to point to Him. To be all that God asks you to be. In Him are all the resources. In Him is the power. In Him is the enabling. In Him is the sufficiency. In and of yourself, you're insufficient. But He is your all-sufficiency. He is your source of wisdom. He is the one, the source of your resources. He is your strength. He is your grace. The living Christ is your ever-present help and resource. Take up your responsibilities and look to Him who is your resource. Now, church, it's your turn. Hang on to your hat. God loves leadership. He does. How do we know that? It's right through the Bible. Right through the Bible. God loves leadership. I want to show you a text today that I just want to give you a few encouragements. And that comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Now, don't be scared about the first word. Us Westerners, and particularly us Australians who've come from a convict background, don't look like the word obey. <laughs> We're not going to do anything that you tell me to do. That's a typical Australian attitude, isn't it? Anybody who's been a teacher knows that very well. <laughs> Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Ah, there's that other word, submissive. For they watch out for your souls. You just can't take the obey and the submissive without understanding that there is a for in this sentence. Whenever you see a for or a therefore in the Bible, always ask yourself the question, what's the therefore, therefore? I'm asking you, I'm telling you, this is what, the, this is, what uh, is being said by the author. I'm telling you, obey and be submissive for the leader who you're under or you serve or you are being submissive to is watching out for your soul. He is the one who gives account for what happens in the church. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. Now, here's an interesting verse that we sometimes oversee or overlook. The problem is that this verse is here at all. Why does it mean to be here? Because people don't always see leadership as God sees leadership. In our culture, obedience and submission to leaders is something that we refuse to do often. I'll help you understand that. Submission implies a spirit of cooperation that stems from trust. You trust that the leaders have your best interests at heart and so you go along with them. Spiritual leaders are there to give account for you. They look out for you. In the NIV it says, have confidence in your leaders. Confidence springs from trust. Confidence and this obedience thing springs from relationship. It's not following blindly. I hate to burst your bubble, but Michael is not perfect. No. 
all this is a resounding amen. <laughs> Michael is not perfect, and so it's not following your leader blindly, but it's following biblically. Following a faithful and a truthful leader. But we know that people complain about the government. Hands up those who've never complained about the government. <laughs> Are you lying, Ken? <laughs> Workers complain about the boss. Students complain about the teachers. Children complain about the parents. And sadly, the Christians complain about the leaders in their church particularly when the leaders know nothing about the complaints. Ouch. This text is here because it's not always done, is it? The Holy Spirit puts this word here so that we might take notice of it. So that what we see, what God requires of the church, of a congregation, this is to all overseers in the church, but today we particularly highlight one overseer as, a, as a, one amongst a team of overseers. Ron, you're involved in this. John, you're involved in this. If Rob was here, we, he'd be involved in this as well, and he is. Notice the words. That he may do it with joy. Church... This is your responsibility, that Michael might do it with joy and not with grief. We forget the next bit, so that it would be profitable for you. Sometimes Christians give their leaders grief, don't you know? Imagine that. Imagine that. Followers of the Lord Jesus Christ... And we give others grief. Listen, let's all be in this together. We've all done it from time to time in our lives, somewhere. Particularly when we are teenagers. Sadly, there are some who are committed to the fine art of grief giving. In one church where I was a pastor, one of the people came to me, who was another leader, and said, I never wanted you to come here in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, I feel so joyful because of that. Not. People say the strangest and most terrible things. Be patient and understanding, church. Be gracious and compassionate. Be forgiving and be kind. In other words, be Christ-like. Do you know the first thing, the first marker of your Christianity is not church attendance? Go! Oh. The first marker and the first highlight of your Christ, you being a Christian is Christ-likeness. Being like Jesus. I wonder if I was looking at when I arrived this morning, I arrived at quarter to nine and the crickets were singing and there was a car at the front. I thought, oh, someone's here, but it was a Church of Christ car that's parked here for some reason. And there was a man on the, the veranda next door just leaning over the veranda and I wondered, what does that man see when he sees this group of people? What does that man experience when he connects with this group of people? Is it just a bunch that turn up on Sunday, hang out for an hour and a half or so, and head off again? No connection at all. Is it a bunch of people that seem to be in the holy huddle that, oh, that's strange little people, they sort of go to this church thing, I don't know what they do in there. What do they do in there? We hear music and we hear stuff, but what are they? Who are they? Or does he see this group of people and say, they're just like Jesus? Is that the measure of our Christianity? That we're like Jesus? 
I get to spend a lot of time with pastors of all different brands, from Uniting to Anglican to Baptist to Churches of Christ to Pentecostal, and lots of different brands, and I get to speak in churches of different brands as well. And if I was to have a private conversation with Michael, we would probably agree, and with those other pastors, we'd probably agree that 90% of a pastor's sorrows don't come from the world. If he can handle that, that's quite okay. They don't come from the world, but they come from, sadly, the people of God. What a tragedy. We defend and believe the Bible, but we don't always live it. If we're going to be people who shine in the community, let us shine in our proclamation of gospel truth. Let us shine also our gospel behaviour. If we say that we are to be Christ-like and we're all heading towards Christ and we're following Christ and we're disciples of Christ, let us show that in our behaviour. Christ-likeness is the mark of the Christian. Standing out in the community, being examples of right living. But we know there are some who deliberately cause grief. But as we see, and we, we can inadvertently do it, there's forgiveness in that, there's mercy in that, there's grace in that. But there are some who deliberately cause grief. But as we see in the verse, is it going to be unprofitable for the leader that you cause grief? No, it's going to be unprofitable for you. There's an old saying, a lot of all of us, I've forgotten where it is. Smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep. The one who gives grief isn't unprofitable to the recipient, but to the one who's giving the grief. And it infects a whole congregation. If you have a sour attitude and a sour face, I guarantee you that you have a sour soul. Have you been in church? I know there's a bunch of people who've been at the front in church before, and it doesn't not this one, but any church. Have you ever looked upon the congregation and seen a sour face? Possible. I was at a funeral the other day at Mount Rabat, that's how I earned my living, being a funeral celebrant. And I was in this service and the lady was Italian who died and, and she had connection with the Jehovah's Witnesses and I was up in front praying like a non-Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and uh, there was one of the Jehovah's Witness uh, gentlemen in the, in the congregation, if looks could have killed. <laughs> I would have been under the earth and already decomposed. <laughs> sour face indicates a sour soul. Imagine the potential of a pastor doing his work with joy. Imagine that potential. I'm going to say to you as a charge to the church, and if you belong to this church, it's not just pointing at you. Whatever church we belong to, I belong to Redcliffe Church of Christ. I, as a congregational member, I've got to give my parts to joy. Whatever church you belong to, behave as God's people. Don't spoil what God has in store through the ministry he has determined to bring through your pastor. He's not perfect, and... But he has recognised and has been recognised and been called by this church to be the pastor. Support him. Be honest with him. Love him and his family. Uphold him and his family in prayer. And bring him joy in your own attitude, by your own behaviour. In that, you will see the blessing of God for it is profitable for you. Living hope, I am calling you and I am charging you to be a light to this community, a light to each other, the shining the light of Christ, living the truth of the gospel in your community and beyond. And may I encourage you to be a church of a culture of Matthew 18. That you speak face to face, not face to back. 18, if you have a problem with someone, go and see them about it. Don't talk to everybody else about it. Go and handle it together.
cult bring that culture into this church and you will be more Christ-like. May God bless you, Michael, Nola, Emily, Sarah, Josiah, Isabel, as a family. And may God bless you, Living Hope Church of Christ in Caboolture. May God bless you as you charge ahead, as you go on into the places where God has called you to be. We charge Michael as the pastor. We charge you as the church who stands with him and the eldership who stand with him to bring the light of Christ into this community and beyond. Let us pray. Father God, we acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives. Father, if there are times in our lives that we have not been in submission to leadership as you have called us to be, would you forgive us? If there have been times that we have caused leaders grief and not joy, would you forgive us? And as leaders, if we have been guilty of causing grief and not joy, would you forgive us? We decide today to repent of those things, to obey your word, and essentially to obey you. You are our supreme leader. You are the one to whom all knees will bow, every tongue will confess. One day, that we choose to bow the knee to you and confess with our mouth that you are our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we will choose to live Christ-like lives. I'm asking, Father, that you would bless this church beyond compare, that you would bless this gathering far beyond their wildest expectations or dreams, and that, Father, you will... This church will see your kingdom come in Kabulcha. They will see your kingdom come in individual lives. They will see your kingdom come in their own life and in their own gathering. And over Michael and Nola, the elders of this church, give them wisdom and grace and insight and courage and strength to serve you, to please you, and to honour you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.